Greetings, welcome to this lecture on political participation in the UK. This is the third lecture on the uh, democracy module in um, UK politics paper one. Um, and over the next few lectures and topics, we're gonna be asking the question about how democratic is the UK. Um, as you know, we have identified that the UK is a representative democracy with some uh, direct democracy elements from time to time. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking about whether the UK is in fact a successful democracy or whether it has issues. Now behind me on the board, and I'm not gonna talk through all of these in this particular lecture, behind me are all of the factors that you could argue creates a successful democracy. And it's a lot more than just voting. If we just kind of scan through the list, we can see peaceful transition of power. That means when one person loses an election and another person then comes in, whether they do so peacefully without kind of like fighting about it or rioting or um, ca causing their protest Protesters, the Storm Congress or anything like that, um, free elections, fair elections, participation in politics, um, freedom of expression and information. Now, if you compare our system to perhaps, say, another country like North Korea, China and things like that, you can see that actually we're, we're pretty strong down that um, left-hand side, although the one that we're going to be talking about, particularly about today, is this widespread participation in politics, which is the, the, the fourth one down. Just behind my head here, freedom of association to join um, various groups and parties like to join a political party to join a pressure group yes i think we have that more or less in the uk unless it's an extreme organization protection of rights and liberties rule of law independent judiciary we've talked a lot about the supreme court over in our previous module so we know that actually the uk has systems in place for that um there are debates over particular rights and liberties and about the Human Rights Act and so on, but you know that we're not too bad on that one. Um, and about limited government, well, that's about to what extent the executive is limited, the, um, the, the system of checks and balances. You know that the UK has some strong things there and some issues there. And I hope that by looking through this slide here, you're starting to kind of see that the UK will score pretty well, but will have certain issues in key areas. And that's why I want to talk about this participation um, topic today, because this is definitely one of the areas where the UK um, does struggle in that we aren't really any more a society of participators in politics in the traditional sense. And as you can see just behind me here, it says a healthy democracy has high levels of participation. I'm just behind my arm there. And the argument for that is if you think about that quote about democracy from a couple of lectures ago, that democracy is of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, a democracy is ruled by the people. Polis, d democracy is, is about... Um, uh, sorry, polis meaning city, a, a democracy is about kind of like gov self-government by the people. And if people aren't involved or participating, then there are issues with whether actually it is government by the people or whether it comes down to a, a, a smaller elite group um, in some way. So let's have a little look um, at a bit of an overview. How can you participate in the UK? How can you, me, anyone get involved? Well, the first obvious way is that you can stand for office to be a local councillor, to be an MP. You might win, you might not win, but there's nothing that actually stops you um, from standing to be an MP. Apart from your age, I apologise, you need to be a certain age before you can stand. But the, excuse me, the idea is, is that anyone can participate in politics, get involved in politics, and if elected, anyone could be Prime Minister. Again, that is not true in all countries. Um, in all systems, but the idea here is very much that anyone can, given the right circumstances, get involved in politics. Active party membership. So this is where we might start to question it, because although anyone potentially can stand for office and anyone potentially can stand uh, belong to a party, most people, the vast majority of people, are not members of political parties anymore. It has gone down and down and down over time. Um, what has become far more common is active pressure group membership. So in other words, people are far more likely to be a member of a specific issue group, such as an, an environmental group or a, or a, a you know, Stop HS2 group or something like that. They're far more likely to be members of a group like that or support a group like that or like you know, hashtag BLM or something like that than actually join a political party. This seems to be the way that the UK has been trending over the last 20, 30 years is that we've, we've moved we're moving away from party poli party political participation to single issue pressure group participation 
Um, I'm not going to read out all the bullet points. You can see them for yourself. You can pause the video at any point if you want to have a look at them. Um, you can also participate kind of passively um, in, a, in either a political party or a pressure group. You can kind of be a member and you can donate and you can give money without actually actively being involved. This is also relatively common in the UK. Um, most of us, of course, have jobs. We are busy and many of us prefer to embrace a bit of capitalism and pay into an organisation without necessarily giving it any of our time. And of course, that does raise questions again about how how much we are participating in de in in democracy and making decisions and and being involved. Another way we can participate, and we're getting to more and specifics here, is that you can recall MPs. So we uh, one of the later one of the later ideas that's going to come up is this idea of. Um, uh, voting in elections and of course uh, you all understand that and that's probably the most common way that you might think about people getting involved in politics but you can remove your MP between elections using the recall of MPs Act uh, which I think came up in 2015 yeah here we go and um, it's happened three times since it happened in, in 2015 uh, twice successfully and once unsuccessfully and basically what happens is is that you sign a petition um, and if you get a certain percentage of a constituency to sign a partition, petition, which is participating, then it triggers a by-election, which is like a general election in just that one constituency, and you can try and unseat your MP. Now, once there was a, 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 a petition and then the MP just won their seat back again, um, this lady here, Fiona Alessania, she got a criminal conviction for lying about a driving offence, and she was removed by her own constituents. And there's another gentleman called Chris Davies, who was also removed uh, for or, um, an expenses scandal. Um, so you can participate between elections to remove your own MP uh, through the Recall of MPs Act, which is quite a handy thing to have if your MP does something that the that en masse people don't like. This one is becoming far more common. You can be a digital activist in the UK. You can sign e-petitions, support a cause, um, change.org, 38 degrees. Yeah, these are all websites where you can sign petitions, you can get involved. The government has its own um, participation um, websites now. Um, maybe maybe if, I, if I could show you the website, it would be good for you to pause the video here and go and have a little look at it. Um, I'll just show you it. Uh, so I've just googled uh, petition.parliament.uk. Uh, this shows you all of the active participate active part petitions that people are signing. Uh, you can see uh, stop the rising number of ear crop dogs in the UK has got 179 signatures in the last hour. Uh, people are very angry at the moment about the idea of COVID vaccine passports. Um, make dog theft a specific criminal offence. Lady Gaga is there. Permit larger wedding guests, uh, larger weddings based on guests testing ne negative. Um, now, the way these petitions work is that they have certain thresholds. If a petition reaches a certain threshold, the government has to respond uh, if it gets 10,000, and you can see some of the responses here. If it gets 100,000 signatures, it will be triggered for debate in Parliament um, and, and, and so on up. And somewhere, I probably should have looked at this in advance. Uh, you can see some of the most successful petitions um, that there have been. Um, and some of the biggest ones might be, you can see the one here about ending child food poverty. Um, I think some of the biggest ones was actually a, a remain petition after uh, after Brexit occurred. There was a petition to remain, uh, which got millions and millions and millions and millions. Um, so have a, have a little look through that website, see what you think. And it, it's because digital activism. Um, has become an increasing way that people in the UK get involved in in politics, um, as well, of course, as things like kind of getting involved in social media and being involved politically by posting about it and talking about it. But of course, that's very different from these kind of more official ways of getting involved that you might see here on the left. And of course, um, you can vote. And I've deliberately left that one to last because it's although it's perhaps the most obvious one, I don't want you to miss out all of these other ones that that, that are there are ways of getting involved and participating in politics. Um, so I want you to be aware of voting, but I also want you to be aware that all of these count as well, and there may well be others I've, I've kind of missed off. 
And when you vote, there are lots of different ways you can vote as well. If I just move myself from one side to the other, like that, um, you can see that you can vote in a general election, but also think about representative democracy lecture last week. You can also vote in local elections, in regional elections, and of course, in a form of uh, direct democracy, democratic uh, politics, you can vote in, in referendums and things like that as well. There are also, in, in some constituencies, it's very rare in the UK, but you have something called open primaries, which is where before an election, Election, you actually vote for the candidates. Uh, the, uh, you might have heard me talk about these in regards to America. Um, America has these all the time, which is where before the election, you have an election to see who's in the election. So if you think about Bernie Sanders versus Joe Biden, that was a primary to see who would be the Democratic candidate. Um, go back eight years to Donald Trump and you had Donald Trump versus Ted Cruz versus Jeb Bush, you know, they were fighting to see who would be the uh, the Republican candidate. It, there are, I think it's like two or three constituents in the UK um, have primaries to like see who will be the conservative candidate, who will be the Labour candidate. It's very rare. I personally think they're quite a cool idea. Um, uh, but we're, we're there very rare and they, but they do, they do sometimes um, happen. But now let me try and tell you why participation is a bit of a problem in the UK. And the first issue is, is that political party membership has absolutely plummeted um, over the last, um, so I'm just trying to make sure my camera is in the right place. I can't click on me. Uh, political party membership has absolutely plummeted over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so, this is uh, hundreds of thousands of membership. So in, in the UK right now, Labour has the biggest party membership by far, it's, and it's not even close. But it's still pretty small. You know, it's, it's le less than a million, um, followed by the SNP, surprisingly, followed by the Conservatives, then Lib Dems, Green, perhaps UKIP, perhaps um, others. They do fluctuate, and of course, when you're a small party, gaining 10,000 or losing 10,000 is a big fluctuation. And so UKIP shot up and then shot down again before and after the Brexit referendums. The Lib Dems did a similar thing uh, when they gained and lost power and so on. Um, the SNP shot up and shot down around the uh, independence referendum and things like that. And Labour actually shot up under Jeremy Corbyn. It was one of the things that kind of pushed him to, uh, to, to his party leadership. But the point is here is that this is tiny. This is small. This is really, really small. There are some countries in the world where it almost like the vast majority of people are members of political party. If you look here, this is the membership as proportion of an electorate. We're talking, and this is, this is us right now, kind of 2018, 19, 20, 21. We're talking that maybe 1% of the active population is a member of the Labour Party, one in 100. And actually all of the other ones are well below 1%. So we're talking like 0.2% of the population are a member of the Conservative Party. And it's probably less than that. You know, it's tiny. It's absolutely tiny. And not only that, not only is it small, it has also gone down. If you look here in 1970, it's, it's up above 3%, which is still small, which is still small, but it's very much gone down and down over time, especially for the Conservatives. Now, if I just move myself up, whoop, uh, it says here, academic surveys suggest that in 2017, more than half of the members of the main six parties belonged to a higher ABC1 social grade. Fewer than half of all members were women, and fewer than 6% have ever stood for office within a political party organisation. So not only is the membership small, it's also fairly unrepresentative. Um, a, a, a higher a, a ABC1 social grade, you're meaning higher earners, probably university educated and there's nothing wrong with that but it, the point is is that this political party membership is not spread across the country and spread across all different demographics it's it's limited to almost perhaps a political class or an upper political class perhaps um now this i this is this one here i find uh, quite shocking this is the idea of how participation has changed over a longer period of time and if you look here back in 1952 conservative party membership it's up in 300,000, 300,000, um, which is a significant proportion of the population. And you can see it's just come down and down over time. So this is a real change to our society um, that has taken place. There has been a general decline, if you want, actually a massive decline, um, that has taken place relatively slowly, but it has been a change of life that whereas before, Many people would have gone to their Labour club or their Conservative club after work. It would have been a, a social club as well as a political club. 
that just doesn't really happen anymore. Um, Labour, the, the Labour Party did manage to boost. You, like, you might well notice this, this like reversal of the trend here amongst the Labour Party. That happened when Jeremy Corbyn stood for election. Um, they introduced this something called the three pound membership, which meant you could join the party for essentially nothing. And uh, when when Corbyn stood for election, there was a big rise amongst very left wing people, um, and especially amongst the young, actually, and many of them joined the Labour Party with a view to explicitly elect Corbyn. Um, and one of the issues with, and I don't want to get too much into this, but I think it's a really fascinating topic. One of the issues with having political party memberships that are so small is that a party can be pulled in this direction or that direction by a relatively small amount of fairly extreme people. And the two examples I would give you here would be the Labour Party was launched to the left by these people joining uh, to support Jeremy Corbyn. And if you support Jeremy Corbyn, that's fine. But my point is here is that it didn't take huge amounts of people to join to pull the whole party away from its kind of middle of the road, centre left position to a far more left wing position where it has struggled um, electorally. Um, the same goes with the Conservative Party. Many members of UKIP after the Brexit referendum joined the Conservative Party, and you'll be aware now that the Conservative Party has pulled itself to a far more anti-European um, position um, because it doesn't take as many people now to, to, to get that. It doesn't take as many people to pull a party in different directions, which of course affects political participation. It affects the health of a democracy. When a small amount of people can control the rest by pulling the major political parties in different directions, you've got an issue. And of course, you can't force people to join political parties, and you shouldn't. Um, but right now, we do have a situation where political parties are controlled by a very small amount of people in the UK. Um, there was a, a surge in SNP membership following the independence referendum, which they lost because of people that really did want the independence. There was a UKIP surge for 2015, but in general, political, political party membership is down and it's staying down. Let me just check the time to make sure I'm not late for something I need to be there for. Another problem with participation in politics is trust in, po in politicians. It is going down and it's staying down. Basically, these days, I'm old enough to remember this, and you're not, but there was a point when I was young where MPs were actually treated fairly respectfully. They weren't necessarily always harangued in the media, although, of course, mocking has always kind of existed in the UK. But there, there was a time when MPs were thought of as being a very respected job and profession. But not anymore. Trust in politicians is at, is at an all-time low, and, it, and it's very much stayed there. There's various reasons for this, you know, various scandals over time, whether you're talking about the um, Suez Canal scandal back in the, the 50s, various sex scandals like the Profumo, Profumo affair, various lies told by politicians over time. But one big thing you can talk about is the newspaper behind me here, which is in the uh, textbook, which I'd like you to be have a look through, which was the expenses scandal um, in 2008, 2009, which was when it was revealed by the Daily Telegraph that MPs had been claiming huge amounts of money on what they call expenses. So for example, an expense is where you work for a job and you buy something for your job and then you can claim that money back. So an example in teaching might be like, say I go out and I buy a load of textbooks for you guys, and then I can claim that money back on expenses. Or let's say I go and do a training course, and so I pay for my train fare to go to a course, and then that's, that those expenses are to do with my job, and so I can claim that money back. That's what expenses is, is for. However, MPs were using it to claim for mortgages that didn't exist, insurance that didn't happen, and in one famous case, an MP claimed for his expenses a £1,600 duck house for his, um, for his pond. Um, MPs were abusing the taxpayers' money, in essence. And this was a, a, a huge deal at the time, and it was one of the more recent factors that really pushed down trust in all politicians. Um, and you can see here, this was a, 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 one I found, a survey I found this morning, so this is from 2020. The red here is the number of people that never trust, or not very often trust, um, various politicians. So Keir Starmer, 33, trust, 19% don't. Still quite big. Jeremy Corbyn, you can see f over half, did not trust him. 
Boris Johnson, it changes over time, it has to be said. People have found him more trustworthy since Corona, but go, go, go pre-Corona, almost half of the country did not trust him either. Um, and it's still a very small percentage that say that he is kind of trustworthy. You're talking one in five, one in, one in four. And government ministers in general, almost half of respondents say that they either don't trust and over half say they don't trust them all the time. We, as a country, do not trust our politicians, which is a problem if the idea is that we are supposed to be in a country where we elect our representatives and we trust them to make decisions on our behalf. If you don't trust your politicians, then you don't trust people to make decisions on your behalf, which means there's a problem with representative democracy. We're not joining parties. We're not involved in parties. We don't trust the people that have been elected by the parties. And on top of that, we are slowly and continually not even bothering to vote as well. I should, I should rephrase that word bothering because that, that sounds like I'm making a judgment. We are deciding for whatever reason to not vote. Could be laziness, could also be a political choice, could also be the textbook makes a suggestion about something called apathy, which is the idea that maybe people are generally happy and therefore they don't kind of get involved because there's nothing to campaign for. There's various arguments as to why this has happened, and we can debate this in perhaps our seminar, but we do need to identify that it has happened. If we look here, in the 1950 election, over 80% of people voted in general elections. Now, you'll never get 100% because let's think about it. You know, you've got people in old people's home, you'll have people that were ill on the day, people that work abroad, whatever like that, you know, there's always going to be a percentage of people that, that don't vote. And over 80% is a very healthy democracy, and I'll show you some other countries in a minute. But if you can look from 1950, you can see this slow downward trend with a few spikes, but it goes down and down until the lowest one is in 2001, where you get 59% vote. Uh, that was Tony Blair's second win. It does slowly recover in 2017, 2019, but we're still talking a percentage of the electorate voting, which is about 64%. If you wrote in your exams, about 65% of people vote, that would be about right. It, you know, it, it has been between 60 to 70% since, uh, since 2000, which is essentially your lifetime really, isn't it? Um, which means that, if you think about that in terms of percentages, it means that one in four people don't vote and it's almost getting to be like two out of five you know so that is that kind of thing so which 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 then again asks questions about well who is actually deciding who runs the country because then you have to start say well who is it that's voting and who is it that's not voting and it, it's often again higher educated richer people older people tend to vote lesser educated working class poorer people tend not to uh, which raises questions about tyranny of the majority, whether parties are actually being representative, and our voting system really doesn't help. Really doesn't help. And in our, one of our next modules, which is on electoral system, you'll see that our voting system has a lot of strengths, but it makes a lot of people's votes pointless, which very much pushes down voting participation. Um, Let's just compare our country to another com other countries to put it into context. Like, I, I don't want to be kind of just pointless UK bashing, so I do want you to kind of have a look at where we, where we lie. So down the bottom here, you can see the names of the countries. Over here, you can see the percentage of people that vote for parliamentary elections. So you can see that we are somewhere around here. You know, we're about equivalent with... with Germany, Spain, Finland, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there are countries that are significantly higher. Sweden, Denmark, Belarus, Luxembourg, Mal. There, 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 there are some places uh, where voting is compulsory, and we'll look at that in the future, this, this idea that you, you have to vote. And obviously voting in the UK is optional, so it's, it's completely voluntary. But if you look at us in relation to the rest of the world, we're not too bad. You know, we're, we're not down here with Romania and France, where, where it's absolutely tiny. Uh, we're we're probably, probably somewhere in the middle. So, you know, if you wanted to actually write in an essay that you actually think our participation is fine, you're going to focus on things like the, the pressure groups. You're going to say, well, actually, comparatively to other countries, we're fine. Um, you know, it is very much possible to make the case that our participation is, that there's no issue here. You can make that case. Um, but it's also possible to say that it's in decline, that there are issues here about participation, there are issues here about, uh, you know, there are other countries that are far more participatory. So what makes the impact about whether people vote and whether people get involved? The biggest determinant is age. 
basically I'm more likely to vote than you because I'm a lot old because I'm older and someone that's a lot older than me is far more likely to vote than than me have a look at this estimated turnout by age 18 to 24 estimated turnout by age 65 plus. Now I'm not 65 plus, and I'm assuming you're not 18 to 24 yet, um, although some of you might be, uh, but you can see, you can just see, look at the difference. Look, look at this, let's take 2015 as an example. If you're over 65, you're almost 80% of you are gonna vote. Um, if you are under 25, then perhaps only less than 50% of you will vote. Um, so young people don't vote. Um, there, there was, there has been talks about things like a youth quake in 2017, and you can see it did shoot up, but actually it shot up from about 50% to about 60%, um, which isn't the, the youth quake that perhaps it was kind of advertised as. It was definitely an improvement. Jer Jeremy Corbyn appealed to young people. Um, not all young people, obviously, but Jeremy Corbyn's values and ideology did appeal to, um, young people they joined many of them joined the labor party and many of them decided to vote for the first time but it is nothing in comparison to ages 65 plus um this is which is a, you can see it's a very consistent number it's consistently high it's consistently strong now what, what's the impact of this well it means if you're a politician you need to win far more older people's votes than younger people's votes which means when you're making a policy and you have a choice between do i lower tuition fees or do i improve pensions from purely from a purely selfish perspective about what will get me elected any policy that benefits older people will is more likely to get you elected than a policy that benefits young people because more of them will vote even if the number even if there's more young people than older people and i don't actually know what the numbers are there but um it means that politicians can think about who will be voting and therefore who they need to appeal to if they wish to be elected. So, so it isn't just a, a percentage where you kind of go, oh, that's interesting. It affects democracy. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, but people get involved during referendums. People got involved in Brexit, um, and, and they did. And it's, it's really good that Brexit has happened from a participation point of view to show us that actually, although as a, as a society, we have become less involved, less interested, less membership of political parties and all that kind of stuff when certain issues turn up we do still very passionately get involved and the two issues i would bring up here would be brexit and scottish independence left hand side here you can see the, the uh, brexit referendum 72 percent of people voted in that referendum which is 10 percent higher than a normal general election and in the Scottish independence referendum, 84% of people voted, 85 if you round it up, um, which is way higher than any British general election, I think maybe ever. Um, but it would be wrong to say, well, hang on a minute then, we need to, we need to go to direct democracy. We need to, we need to, we need to have a system whereby people can vote because people get involved, people vote on single issues. No, 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 not true. They vote if they're interested in the issue. Um, EU membership in 1975, 63%. Scottish devolution, 60%. Welsh devolution, 50%. And there was a referendum in, in 2011 over whether we should change our voting system. And we'll look at this uh, when we get to the electoral systems unit. But we had a national referendum on changing the voting system that we all would use to elect our government and only 42% of people voted. So we need to actually deduce from this that referendums don't get people involved certain topics or certain issues get people um I involved um and then you you can perhaps be the judge of whether then referendums are a good thing or, or democracy direct democracy kind of um helps um now this slide i will get I'll, I'll put into our kind of seminar group and this gives you some links to uh, e-petitions and pressure groups and places and areas that people have kind of got involved um, but it shows you um, that the UK is generally getting more involved in in pressure groups and and e-petitions as their way of political involvement um, and we are very much getting involved in in terms of social media 
um, and there's a, there's a link here that again I will send out for our seminar lessons um, for us to look at. But some famous um, participation, social media participation you may have heard about, um, hashtag Black Lives Matter or BLM, hashtag Me Too, hashtag MAGA, obviously that's an American one. Uh, one below me here, Je suis Charlie. Um, if you haven't got a Twitter account um, and it doesn't ethically offend you, um, I would certainly recommend making one and having a look um, a few times a week because then you can see that oftentimes people are talking about football and Love Island or whatever, but people do get involved in politics on Twitter. It is a place where you can see kind of general trends about how people are feeling and what issues are going on. Whether it makes a difference, I think interestingly, you'd have to say before Trump, you might well make an argue that social media doesn't, doesn't make much difference to politics. But since Trump's tweets have had huge impact and social media has been used hugely in the, the three issues that I've kind of identified here, we can now see that say, probably relatively confidently that social media has become a huge tool in political participation. So there you go. So we've talked today about what a healthy democracy might be, um, and we'll be expanding on that. And then we focused particularly on this idea of political participation. And we've talked about the fact that perhaps there is a political participation crisis in the, in the UK. Um, and I would like you to read um, in your textbooks um, the page numbers from um, 11, 12, 13, 14, yeah, 12, 12, to, 12 to 14, I think, is what I would like you to look at in detail, taking some notes um, and making sure you've understood it and be prepared to talk about it in our um, next seminar. And, and for, that's from, the, from that textbook, for any, if any of you aren't sure. Thanks for watching, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in class. Bye-bye.